what's that? Okay, well, welcome uh, everyone. Our first speaker today is Sebastian Dejaro. Sebastian's a visiting fellow here at the DHI, a philosophy, until February of 2019. Uh, he is a faculty member at the Amsterdam University College and the University of Amsterdam in, uh, in philosophy, uh, theoretical physics, and mathematics. He's also completed a PhD at the University of Cambridge in uh, the history of philosophy and science, in particular in the philosophy of physics in the Jeremy Rutherfield, where he's also a member of, of Trinity College. He works on a variety of issues in theoretical physics and in philosophy of physics, uh, including duality, theoretical, theoretical equivalence, emergence, and epistemological aspects of science, as well as historical aspects of quantum gravity. Uh, it's a pleasure to have him here, and he will today tell us about heuris the heuristic function of the Okay, thanks for us for for the generous introduction. Um, so this talk is about uh, dualities and heuristics, and I'm aware that many of you actually work on dualities, so for those of you who work on, on dualities, uh, it will be kind of simple, but uh, quoting Jeremy Butterfield, one shouldn't underestimate the pleasure that an audience can take in hearing what it already understands. So I hope that for those of you who work on dualities, uh, that you will recognize it. Uh, but for those of you who don't work on dualities, um, hopefully, uh, it will make clear what how dualities what dualities are and how we use them. So here's uh, the outline of the talk. Uh, we'll first explain what what is a duality and give a very brief example of bosonization. Uh, then I will say something about what I mean by theoretical and heuristic functions of dualities, and then um, I will go into how dualities. Uh, appear in string theory. So dualities have become uh, standard tools for theory construction in theoretical physics for a long time, uh, already since uh, the, the birth of quantum mechanics, the discovery of position momentum duality uh, was an important ingredient of building uh, quantum mechanics and its silver space representation. Electric magnetic duality in, in Maxwell's theory, also an important uh, heuristic principle. Kramer's linear duality in uh, statistical mechanics played an important role in solving the 2D IC model by Onsager. But especially more recently in string theory, dualities have, uh, have come center stage. Uh, and here are three examples. Um, so Polchinski's discovery of D brains in 1995, where he discovered that in string theory, apart from having strings, there are also high, higher dimensional objects, uh, which he called D brains which were already called uh, D-brains. Um, he, he showed that these, these uh, objects uh, appear naturally in, in string theory, and part of his argument used, uh, the, uh, used the existence of dualities. Also, uh, Sumitra and Vafal's calculation uh, shortly after of black hole entropy from D-brain microstate counting also used uh, various dualities. Malvasina's ADSCFT conjecture relating gravitational and non-gravitational physics is, a, is one of the most famous examples of a duality that we have now. Um, so dualities in string theory are seen as central tools for finding the still unknown M-theory and also for learning, learning a great deal about theories that we already have but which we can study from, from various angles uh, using dualities. So in this talk, um, I will discuss dualities as tools or as methodologies for theory construction. So I will be interested in how physicists use those uh, dualities when they, when they construct theories. And the basic idea of the talk is that there are two types of ways in which dualities function there. So there will, I will make a distinction between what I will call the theoretical and the heuristic functions of dualities. Um, so the, the theoretical function aims at discovering and describing, uh, you could say, equivalent physics. So we have two theories, and there is an equivalent, an exact equivalent between them. On the other hand, the heuristic function does something slightly different. It suggests new physics that goes beyond the duality relation itself. In some cases, the duality may not even be exact, but it's still the fact that there is an approximate duality may suggest new physics. Um, but, but if we take the simplest duality,s like sine Gordon curing, do they suggest? Would you say they suggest new physics? Or? Um, so, yeah. So the, the sine Gordon curing duality has actually that's one of my examples. 
my examples, has been used recently, has been generalized to higher dimensions to, uh, so to describe appro approximate dualities in three and four dimensions. And so in the infrared limit, uh, you get an approximation of uh, sang gordon theorem duality, but it, it has been used by people, by um, Andreas Karsh and, uh, and others, as a kind of guiding principle for finding dualities in, in three, of, of gauge theories in three and in, and in four dimensions. Um, on the other hand, I'm not saying that every duality suggests those two functions, but that very often, in most of the cases, uh, we have those two, uh, those two uh, functions. So the theoretical is just the, the practical use of the duality of yeah. two for getting, calculating things a different way, exactly. and, and the heuristic is the sort of the conceptual implications for how we think about physics, is that, is that what you mean? Um, I will, I mean, maybe as we will go along it, it will become more clear, but the, so the, the heuristic function um, go, finds a theory that does not necessarily instantiate the duality exactly. So it, the duality is, uh, is within the theory in some approximate form, but not in exact form. But I, uh, I, I will uh, go into it. So uh, the recent philosophical literature has been uh, has been interested in explicating the notion of duality and also relating it to traditional notions in philosophy of science, such as the equivalence of theories. But actually, uh, most of the literature has concentrated, at least in the, on the philosophy side, philosophers have concentrated on analyzing cases of exact dualities. So, so the use of dualities uh, to establish exact equivalences, but they haven't really um, emphasized the second aspect of the dualities, which is motivated by the M-theory program, um, where physicists claim that dualities point to near physics. And, I, and in a minute, I will show some quotes from physics papers on that. So I will take uh, well the simplest possible view on dualities, um, which I take from uh, papers in, in physics, where they uh, describe duality as an isomorphism between theories. So for example, position versus momentum representations in quantum mechanics are related by, by a Fourier transformation. They describe the same system equally well, even if they do so uh, using different variables. Now, since in a duality we are relating two theories or two models, uh, which are found to be representations of a single theory, this also prompts us to push our talk of theories or models kind of one level up. So we normally don't think of position and momentum representations as two different theories. They are the same theory, they are two representations of the same theory. So I will adopt the same, uh, the same jargon for, for dualities as well. So I will talk about two dual models and I will reserve the word theory for either the theory that is the common core to the two models or, uh, in the second case, I will, I will discuss a theory that goes beyond that common core. Now, for concreteness, the details will not really be important in this talk, but um, it is useful to think of dualities, sorry, to think of theories and models as triples uh, of uh, a state, state space, a set of quantities, typically an algebra, for example, a Hilbert space of uh, so this, uh, the, the, the state space would be a Hilbert space in the quantum case, an algebra of uh, operators, and a dynamics, uh, for example, Church of Hamiltonian. Uh, nothing of what I will say really hinges on this particular choice. You can use the you can represent theories in different ways, but it's helpful to think of a theory uh, in this way. So when you talk about quantities, you talk about only measurable quantities. Yeah. So. In, in quantum theory would be uh, self adjoint operators. I mean, it depends a little bit on the kind of application that you have in mind. You could enlarge it to include also things like ladder operators, but uh, normally it will be uh, observable quantities. Um, so in particular, in the, in, the, in the case of duality, it will be only the, the observable quantities. So with this notion of a theory and model of a triple, uh, now the simple idea of a duality is to take an isomorphism between model triples. So we define a duality between two models, M1 and M2. These are both triples. 
to be an isomorphism uh, first of the Hilbert spaces, uh, and then also an isomorphism between the sets of quantities, such that the values of all the quantities match uh, between all the states, and so in the quantum case, this would be all the correlation functions of the operators calculated in the first model or calculated in the, in the second model using the duality should, uh, should appropriately match. And also, the duality map is equivalent for the two theories, uh, for the two triples dynamics. So it is a commuting diagram between the duality and the anti-dynamics. Now, you can instantiate this, this, this notion in, in the example of bosonization. So at its, at its simple, uh, bosonization is a duality between a free massless bosonic scalar field phi in two dimensions, so simply into two dirac here, and the free massless Dirac fermion psi. Um, so there is an, an isomorphism uh, between the quantum field, so the derivative of the scalar field is related to this fermion bilinear, uh, appropriately uh, normally ordered, and also the other way around. You can also go from this fermionic quantity to this operator over here, which is which is in this fermion. Now this isomorphism is ensured by the fact that the two models share the same the same algebra. They are both based on the uh, enveloping uh, Versoro algebra, which is the Versoro algebra with central charge one in this case, um, uh, coupled to an abelian algebra at level k plus one in this case. Now, the unitary irreducible representations of this algebra are known to be unique up to unitary equivalence, so that's what underlies the, uh, the duality. In this case, the duality between the bosonic and the fermionic models is a consequence of that unitary equivalent of, of the two representations. Now, this, this uh, duality has been generalized <coughs> to include, uh, like uh, it was already mentioned, massive, uh, massive bosons, massive uh, fermions, and also uh, you can include a potential, and also non-abelian cases have been worked out. So already in this simple example, we can see the contrast between two possible functions of duality. One is the, the one that we're used to, the, the one that comes easiest to mind, namely the theoretical function, which aims to un uncover what is the common structure underlying these two models. If somebody tells me, well, I have these two models, Calculations over here match with calculations over there. If, I w if somebody wants to prove that duality, then they will look for some uh, either an, an exact match or maybe even better, they will try to work out kind of a common structure, like I just showed in, in, in terms of this, uh, of this uh, underlying algebra. So that's the theoretical function. In this case, it is guaranteed by the isomorphism of the two algebras of operators and their unitary, the, the unitary equivalence of their representation. <coughs> now the second, um, second function, which duality can have, often has, is that we seek to apply the duality to cases where the duality only holds approximately. Uh, but it's still useful as a guiding <coughs> principle. So for example, uh, higher dimensional realizations of personalization in three dimensions and in four dimensions have been found uh, recently where personalization is actually not exact, but it's only exact in the infrared limit. Um, here, for example, that last, forget about that last sentence, there was a mistake. Uh, there basically what happens is that you have an approximate duality in, for example, in, in three dimensions. Uh, between a certain bosonic, well, a certain theory with bosons and fermions, and another theory with bosons only. Uh, but that, uh, as you go to the infrared, you recover the, uh, the, under, the uh, usual bosonization. Okay, so four comments about these two functions of the duality. They are both expressed in the physics literature, I will go into that in a moment. The, they reflect, sometimes they reflect actual scientific disagreements about what the unifying theory um, underlying a duality relation looks like. Uh, I will say more 
about this in a, in a moment as well, but it's clear that if we have these two, we, we presented with a duality, we might look for two things. We might try to actually prove the duality, or we might try to see what further physics that duality suggests. The third point is that they, in fact, correspond to different aims, different uses of the notion of duality, and lead, lead to different results. Nevertheless, they are not in contradiction, so they simply exemplify different ways in which theory construction can be, can be approached and is approaching in practice. So um, the theoretical function, so to go a little bit deeper in, into what these functions are, a theoretical function aims at developing what we could call a given theory. So a theory that, that is not novel, but for, for which we have some constraints. So the, the theory is given even in, if only explicit, implicitly in the sense that there is a set of rules to obtain it. For example, we have these two models, and we know one model very well, but we don't know the other as well, but we know that we are, it's conjectured that there is a duality. So that might prompt us to work out that duality. So there's a set of rules naming, naming find, finding that, that duality. Um, this theoretical function is used, for example, uh, when uh, if somebody gives me a, a Hamiltonian describing a system in classical mechanics, and they ask me to work out the equations of motion. Now, the equations of motion do not follow immediately for the Hamiltonian because there are choices that you have to make, such as boundary conditions and so on. But basically, once I have the Hamiltonian, basically the equations of motion are already there. That's the basic idea of the theoretical function. There may be some choices of boundary conditions that I have to make in between, but basically, once I have the Hamiltonian, the equations of motion are implicit. So this is what I call the theoretical function. So it would be handing uh, me the Hamiltonian, and then I, I work out the, the uh, equations of motion. So therefore, a theoretical function is not primarily aimed at finding physical novelty, even if it sometimes may find it. Rather, its aim is making more prestigious the conceptual and uh, mathematical presentation of the theory. Another example would be the use of symmetries to produce new states or new solutions. If I have a set of equations of motion and I know one solution and I have uh, some symmetry that <coughs> the equations satisfy, then starting from this solution I can generate other solutions in an almost, uh, I mean not quite machinery-wise manner, but sometimes you might be able to do that in, 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 a, in a deductive manner. So that's, that's the theoretical function. There is some kind of rule that that uh, at least implicitly uh, tells what the theory is. Now, theoretic, uh, heuristic function is quite different. Hewell describes heuristics as the art of discovery, uh, which he admits that it, it doesn't have to do with, with logic. Uh, because generally, there are no mechanical rules or techniques as like we do have in the theoretical function. So heuristics involves craftsmanship and creativity. So the aim is the formulation of new theories with new physics, rather than merely reformulating more precisely what, what we already know. So the theoretic, heuristic function may have some rules of its own, rules that are developed as we go along. For example, constraints that the theory should satisfy, or some rules of thumb. But its defining mark like, lies in the theoretical and physical note is the, the fact that there is this step because what we know and what we don't know. So that's why we need the, where, where creativity is needed there. Uh, so this novelty could include the number and the nature of the degrees of freedom, the dynamics, rules for calculation, novelty in the interpretation. So that will be the heuristic function and now applied uh, to, the, to the same example I gave before, a system for the, the analogy would be with a system for which we want to find the Hamiltonian. Uh, we don't know the Hamiltonian, and we try to find it, as opposed to merely finding the equations of motion from a given Hamiltonian. So, of course, this is what students find hardest. If you, if you give them the Hamiltonian, then it's easy to derive the equations of motion and, de and derive the, equation, the, the motion of objects. But it's harder to find the Hamiltonian itself from kind of a physical situation. Um, so, the, because that may involve writing down some parts of a Hamiltonian that we already know from similar systems, but some other parts we don't know, and so we have to guess, 
or we constrain them using symmetries, um, and so on. Uh, also, using knowledge about the admissible kinds of interactions. So even if physicists are able to come up with fairly systematic rules sometimes for constraining the admissible classes of Hamiltonian, usually that only works for a class of similar problems. In the end, there is no general rule for writing down the Hamiltonian for a physical system. And that's, of course, what things that make physics interesting and, and exciting. Now, applied, uh, I, I now want to apply this to, to duality. Um, so string theory is a candidate for theory for the unification of general relativity and quantum field theory. Its basic assumption is that particles are not point-like, but they are surfaces like this. Um, as probably everybody knows, uh, it requires 10 space-time dimensions for internal consistency. In the low-energy limit, it is well approximated by supergravity theories. Now, initially, there were five string theories known, but in the 90s, um, dualities were found between these different theories. T-duality relates type to A, string theory on a circle of radius R to type to B on a circle of radius 1 over R. Uh, so uh, people found that these, these um, string theories are related to each other. Uh, so in, in 95, we can conjecture that the fine five known string theories plus a sixth 11 dimensional supergravity theory were, were different limits of a conjecture theory which uh, was the M theory. So what we then assumed is that the 11th dimension was a circle and he identified the radius of the circle with a coupling constant for the joining and splitting interactions of the strings. So that when the circle is small, we have weakly interacting strings and so the string, perturbative string description is valid. Now at strong coupling, the perturbative string description is not valid, uh, but there is a regime where 11-dimensional supergravity can be used, so 11-dimensional uh, supergravity was conjectured to describe M-theory at strong string coupling and low energies. So when the length of the fundamental string is small, so that we have basically a point particle limit. And so the challenge was, and still is, to find a theory that is valid away from the point particle limit in, in 11 dimensions. There have been several approaches to M, to M theory. One of the main ones is called uh, matrix theory. That's a proposal by Banks, Krishner, uh, and others. Uh, ADS CFT, another of the approaches um, to, uh, to non perturbative strings. Now, the question one, one question uh, that you could ask is should M theory exhibit these dualities exactly? Or should the dualities be superseded in the final theory? I, are the dualities merely ways towards the formulation of, of a new theory? And so um, I have some quotations here showing different attitudes towards duality and string theory in general, not specific to the M theory. Some of these relate to M theory, others are, are not specific to M theory. So for example, Polchinski in his uh, textbook defines duality as the equivalence of seemingly distinct physical systems. Such an equivalent of an horizon on a single quantum theory has the same classical limits. The duality is just a different description of the same theory. Um, okay, so the, all these quotes here stress this same point, that a du duality is exact, and it has to do with the sameness of the theory. So, so this part of the literature du treats dualities as exact, and I here have more quotes, including from Maldacena and others. I'm going to skip those because I'm running out of time. Another take on duality is duality is approximate. That graph connects the approximate nature of dualities to a suggestion of the existence of new theories. He regards dualities as expansions in a modular space of theories where the duality basically takes you from one expansion point to another expansion point. So he doesn't assume that there is an exact duality between those points. It's very much like doing a Taylor expansion uh, around different points and then relating uh, the results. The results need not be exact. So here we got dual, dual models as inexact. Um, we then also have some quotations that point in the same direction. 
So along this second line, establishing duality is not the goal. Rather, it is an intermediate step towards finding what we could call a successor theory, TS. So we have these expansion points, and those expansion points point us towards the whole space of theory. And so, so we can find this, this, uh, this successor theory. So you, one might think that there is a tension here between these two accounts. Namely, duality as an exact equivalence, and duality as merely being uh, approximately instantiated uh, by different theories. So, uh, and reason for th to think that there is a, might be a tension is that the two accounts do not refer to two different as aspects of levels of explanation or of the ontology of the theory. Um, and also that the first sense of duality assumes an exact duality, while the latter sense, the one by Dekhraam and others, assumes that, du that dualities are not exactly instantiated, thus pointing to, to a new uh, theory. Now, I agree that there is a tension, but it can be resolved. Namely, there are two different projects. One is working out a common core theory, T, that instantiates the duality explicitly, if, if one is lucky, of course. The second project is developing a successor theory that goes beyond the duality. And so these projects are different, but they are compatible. Uh, they lead to the construction of different theories, T versus TS. So it's a different mythology, mythology and aim. Um, but one could well expect that the, th the common core theory, T, gives us an approximation to the successor theory, TS in a relevant regime, so that the two projects are actually compatible. Mm -hmm. So the attitudes towards the structure of the two models will also differ between T and TS. In the project of developing the common core theory, T1 is interested in what is common and not in the specific structure of the model, but rather in what is common between the two. In the project of developing the successor theory, the specific structure that is not common to the, to the two models might well give us clues towards, uh, towards finding this theory TS. So to summarize, the aim of the theoretical function is to discover or to reconstruct dual models that are implicitly there by the duality conjecture. The result, if one is lucky, is a common core theory that makes the duality explicitly, and it could, so in this, in this sense, duality might end up just being a symmetry of kind of a larger theory, uh, this common core theory. The common core theory also has advantages. It will be formally more perspicuous. It may admit new interpretations, and it also may admit new models. On the other hand, the heuristic function aims to discover a successor theory, so a theory whose content goes beyond the original models, and of which the dual models are approximate instantiations. So in, that, in this case, we don't need to assume that there is an exact duality. So dual models often come with specific structure, the theoretical function aims at kind of forgetting about that specific structure because one is interested in what is common. On the other hand, a heuristic function might make use of the specific structure since it might get reinterpreted as a physical structure in the successor theory, TS. So one, ex one also expects that, that T could be obtained by TS by making the, approxim the appropriate approximation. So that's all I have for you. Thank you. Um, so, in the case of momentum, position momentum duality in quantum mechanics, and reformulating that in the language of Hilbert spaces, we regard the Hilbert space as a common theory because it you could do everything yeah. exactly in momentum space and exactly in position space, but there's this common core between the two. Um, whereas for the case of string theory, the idea is that M theory is is not you can't do everything in these sort of uh, weak coupling limits of string theory, but you would need really a successor theory, M30, to do the calculations in this regime between them. Um, but well, I'm curious, so... Well, is there, I, mean, could, I mean, in practice or in principle? In practice. In practice. In practice, you might not be able to do couplings in the sort of, in the middle the of the... The calculation might get too hard. That's right. Like in the middle of the web diagram, right? You might not be able to do a calculation. So you can't, like, take, you know, 
type one A string theory and calculate anything in the entire in all the phases of string theory from it. Like you could run into could, space. But couldn't things. you also find an example in particle wave duality where the potential was complicated enough and there were enough interacting that you you can't you can't do the calculation in one picture. Hmm. That seems like a technical issue, right? Right. 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 So, yeah, that, that's right. Are you, in principle, unable to do calculations in the middle of the sort of M theory web diagram, starting from one corner? Or is it just a matter of you have the wrong degrees of freedom to do it? Well, the perturbation theory doesn't converge. Right. So there's the question of whether you can resum the perturbation theory and whether there are ambiguities in resumming the perturbation theory. Right. Whether you can analytically continue the if, if function, but 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 generally, but generically, we believe that in the in the strong interactions, for example, we can't we can't compute the mass of the blue ball in SE three gang null theory. But I guess we it's, we can't even prove the theory exists. But I, I think most physicists believe that um, the perturbation theory defines the theory exactly up to one ambiguity, which you must specify, which is the bad angle. An ambiguity that you encounter when you try to resolve the, the series. There you can sort of barely imagine doing it. In M theory, you can't even imagine it, but it's doesn't seem conceptually different. So there's this question of if there is an in-principle inability to calculate things, then we should regard M-theory as a successor theory in this language. And if it's just an in-practice obstruction, then we should regard it as just a more convenient common core. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, so for, for according to, to the definition I was giving, the, whether it's a successor theory or a common core theory, is the question whether the duality is exact within M theory. So, so I guess the, the contrast would be whether the duality is exactly instantiated, for example, whether T duality is an exact duality of M theory, or only an exact duality of, say, the perturbative tied to M tied to the string theory. So I have an example that may be cleaner than this, because I think there's a question about where exactly M theory falls on common core versus um, uh, so you can represent uh, analytic dynamics in a Hamiltonian picture, a Lagrangian picture, a Hamilton-Jacobi picture. And in some sense, you could regard these as sort of dual descriptions of the same thing, where there's some common core theory you're trying mm -hmm. to describe and these diff very different languages yeah. for describing yeah. it. Um, but the Hamilton-Jacobi picture offers this, it offers different specific structures that make the transition to wave mechanics easy. As Schrodinger did to guess wave mechanics, he looked at the mm -hmm. the isosurfaces of the Hamilton Jacobi principal function and, and identified them as being the the wave fronts of, of a wave function. Whereas starting from the Hamiltonian picture, it, it, or even from a Newtonian differential equations picture, it wasn't clear how to transition from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics. So in that case, it's clear that you're looking for a successor theory, right? You're you're mm -hmm. you're going to go from classical physics to quantum physics. And one of the dual pictures has specific structures in it, mm -hmm. principles, Hamil Hamilton's function. And that specific structure becomes a physical structure. It becomes yeah. the wave fronts of a wave function, which, according to Schrodinger, at least, was a physical structure in quantum theory. That's actually an interesting example. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. And I think it's a cleaner example where, like, you really, you really are making a heuristic jump yeah. to something that's really different from mm -hmm. Newtonian mechanics. In the same spirit, mm -hmm. would you say having got Schrodinger and Heisenberg, this this leap would be going to relativistic quantum mechanics? Because you've got this beautiful uh, duality, but then you know it's not automatic how you go to relativity. Would that be your heuristic uh, jump at that point? I would. I'm not or sure. Two I'm not sure. I mean, uh, one would have to study the the historical case study to make. Uh, I mean, it it doesn't. You know, from the limited knowledge that I have of the historical episode, it doesn't seem to me like a case of that. 
But Schrodinger himself wrote a relativistic version. Yeah. yeah. Right, which I think only works for thing zero. Yeah. But uh, he wrote it, and that was clear analogy with the non-relativistic. But I'm not sure that it was based on, on a kind of, on the duality itself. Uh, I mean. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we, I'd like to see the the historical example. Okay. okay. So we're going to we can thank Sebastian. Okay, so I'm happy to introduce our second speaker, Henry Roosh. He's a postdoc in the math department at Columbia, and he's speaking to us about horizon stability of the middle Penrose and quality. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. My first visit to Harvard. So, uh, it's been a lot of fun. So, today, what I'd like to start off doing is just to tell you what is the Penrose inequality, and then uh, the experts in the audience will probably commit a couple of heresies along the way, but I think it helps with the intuition behind the picture. And then I'll go on to talking about how I've attempted to attack the problem, or at least get some in insider uh, perspective using a quasi-local mass that I've been playing with, and then we'll end up with how that relates to horizons, and how horizon stability plays as well. So I believe this is the one I should be using, because it a specific button I should play with? Mm -hmm. Just the right one? There's a, there's a foolproof button right here, so I'll go there. So we'll start off with a space time. So we've got a four dimensional Lorentzian manifold, and I'm going to be assuming the physics behind the space time is of an isolated system. So, a collection of stars or a black hole, for example. And a mathematically useful way to picture this, or at least in order to give you the inequality and to describe the inequality, is to think of a compactification of the space-time manifold into what we call a Penrose diagram. So that's what you're seeing in this diamond here. And when we compactify, this diamond gives us the vertical direction as the time direction that we have in our space, and you can think of the horizontal direction as the outgoing space direction, and then every point in the Penrose di diagram is actually an S2 in our original manifold. And one thing that makes this compactification useful is it brings so everything inside the diamond is exactly the space-time that we're dealing with, and it allows us to bring infinities onto the boundary, so it helps us mathematically to deal with quantities of infinity like total mass and total energy. So how does this lead us towards the Penrose inequality? Well, for an isolated system, we have this compactification telling us near these infinities, we can actually use a, a rigorous way of describing that the space-time becomes flat. So if you're in an isolated system, imagine you're an observer far out, then if you have, for example, a black hole, you would start to see as you move far away that this thing is approximated by a particle, for example. And then you would, as the observer at infinity, you could imagine having a hyperplane play the, the role of your rest space at that instant of time and you would use that in some way or another to actually calculate the total mass of the system. Now we recover this from the Penrose, di Penrose diagram, and what plays the role of an instant of time is a Riemannian slice, which is represented by C here. And what we specify, which is part of this isolated structure, is that it becomes asymptotically Euclidean as you move to infinity. And one therefore has a mechanism, which I'll say so some more about in a couple of slides, and this mechanism can be used to actually hopefully get back to the screen. So when one specifies the slice to be asymptotically Euclidean, there is actually a mechanism called the Hawking energy that we can use to actually make sense of what the total energy is at that instant of time. Now, we can also use that mechanism for intersections of a hypersurface with a black hole horizon, which I'm representing here by this double line. 
And this mechanism also tells us what the mass is of that intersection, and it turns out it is geometrically related to the area of the black hole. Okay, so imagine this to be the mass of the black hole, which is related to the area of the square root of a 16 pi. And what we know from, or what we assume in physical systems where this initial data, if you like, is physically reasonable, is if you are able to solve, we expect as gravitational radiation radiates away, you end up with a stationary rotating vacuum black hole. And that's what this dotted triangle is telling us here. Far into the future, we expect the space to settle to occur. Now, the Hawking area theorem actually tells us that as you uh, slide your black hole along this horizon, reasonable curvature assumptions that represent energy density, non-negative energy density, will tell us that the areas of the black holes increase. So this mass increases as we approach and stabilize in the curve region. Could be crystal zero. Yes. And uh, we can, if we assume, so this is a highly heuristic argument, right? But if we assume that we move into the Kerr region, then we can actually compare this black hole horizon mass to something called the bonding mass of the space time. Now, the bonding mass will also say a little bit more about in a couple of slides, but you can think of that as the total mass of your space, but you've modded out by gravitational radiation that you've lost to the past. So I'll say some more about that in a couple of minutes. But importantly, why that comment that you've lost gravitational <coughs> waves is if you go up to curve, this that mass, having lost gravitational waves, is smaller than the total mass that we had in our original slice. So that leads us to the Penrose inequality. It says, it says that if you have an asymptotically Euclidean Ramanian slice inside of your space, we expect the black hole mass, which is a geometric quantity related to its area, to be bounded above by the total ADM mass of the Arnowit, the same Mesner for this slice, which is a measure of the total mass according to this asymptotic Euclidean slice. Okay, so the Penrose inequality is that the mass of the black hole related to the area is bounded above by this quantity, which we, is a geometric invariant that we can calculate directly from the slice. So look here, I used this picture to motivate this progression to get to the inequality, but both of these quantities that give us this inequality can be purely stated in terms of the geometry of this asymptotic Euclidean slice. So that leads us to the motivation for why this is interesting, well, because it's completely... Is that, is that, is that are those inequalities proof or are they... No, 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 this is the heuristic reason that Penrose gave in 73 for why he expects this to be true. What we're trying to do, what the, the aim is here, yet. it hasn't been proven in, it's been proven in special cases, but the, the general inequality is still open. There, but there's no counterexample. So that would be an example of you making a remarkable contribution if you could find a, a counterexample. There have been counterexamples with, with spherically symmetric uh, instances, I think Krista Dewey gave us, but, but they have very unstable space times, if I understand correctly. So in the true form that we would love it, it's still completely open in general. So I'll tell you some more specific examples. That there must be proven. some energy conditions you must see. Exactly. So, no, wait, there, let, me, let me tell you exactly what those are. Okay. So, but the, the point I wanted to make is I used this incredibly heuristic argument to get you to the inequality, but it reduces to an inequality with a geometric statement on, a one, on one Euclidean slice. So one thing we can try and do is just prove it directly without having to deal with the global structure, et cetera, et cetera. But therein lies the use of this inequality. So you might say, okay, great, that's a nice inequality. Who cares? Well, firstly, Penrose used this global structure and stability assumptions to get to it. So inevitably, if one was able to, to prove the challenge, it would inform this global structure in some way or in another. If you were to disprove it, it would also inevitably inform the assumptions of the structure. So by proving the inequality, this will inevitably inform us about the existence structure. Is it, is it weaker or stronger than cosmic censorship? Cosmic censorship is part of the assumption that goes into the picture that I gave you. Oh, you get to assume cosmic censorship. Cosmic censorship is an ingredient that one uses. If the cosmic example is cosmic censorship, it, it does not hold. Yes, it but would not be. not other way around, I think. Yeah, exactly. It would really cause. Hold... It probably could never be proven in this way because the event horizon is different. We have to know the future very well. Yeah, exactly. So all the proof are assuming the fair horizon. Yeah. And so, therefore, uh, the Current proof will never succeed. I think. Wait. So which, which of the some of those arrows have been proven? Yes. So, <laughs> so <laughs> this one has been proven. Which is the, which this is the one? This one has been one? proven in very specific geometric. Left hand side is proven only for event horizon, but not for yes, sorry, but not for a pair. Not horizon. a pair. That, that's why it's almost impossible to prove. Yeah. In this way. 
But what, couldn't you make the conjecture for the event horizon? Yeah, the conjecture is supposed for event horizon, but whatever proven now is for the current horizon. Aren't the areas there for the event horizon? There's no area field for a current horizon, that's why. Yeah, so... It's it, not true. No, but I, I, I'm confused what you're saying. It, this conjecture is for the event horizon. Yeah. So why are we talking about the parent horizon? And the, the, and the, the theorem. So whatever has been proven is all for a parent horizon. Oh, but the area theorem's been proven. So Not assuming for cosmic censorship for the event horizon. Yeah, that's right. This is one humongous carpet that I'm sweeping the actual proofs in. This is very much just a heuristic argument I'm playing. So yeah, you're right. This has been proven for not necessarily the same we're playing with, but this was the motivation that led to the inequality. So like I said, I'm committing some various heresies here, but I want to just motivate where the inequality came from in Andres' original argument. So yeah, the various aspects have been proven. They're not all linked together in a perfect way, but this is the argument that led to the inequality. So pieces of that inequality, if you were to, for example, find a counterexample for the Andres' conjecture, it would seriously cause into question cosmic censorship. Or various aspects, and that would be very interesting from the framework point of view for GR. So yeah, heresies and plenty, but I would like to just get to the inequality. So if we do get to the inequality, that will, if proven directly, will have some interesting indications for the existence theory. Moreover, one of the conditions that we're assuming, especially part of the Hawking area theorem, is that your space time satisfies something called the dominant energy condition, which is a local constraint on the curvature modeling physically a non-negative energy density. And a proof of the Penrose inequality, you can think of them also as a geometrically interesting inequality as an advanced fundamental theorem of calculus, if you like. So it has various interests from the structure all the way down to the actual geometric constraints that it imposes. Okay, so here I was very, very vague. Let's dig a little bit deeper into what I mean by ADM mass and ADM energy, because I would eventually like to move the Penrose conjecture onto the null setting. So here is a diagram, for example, of an asymptotically Euclidean slice. Now, your slice could be at rest relative to your black hole, in which case this mechanism that I've been telling you about is actually a measurement of the Hawking energy. So because we're asymptotically Euclidean, there's a meaningful coordinate chart and therefore saying that you've got coordinate spheres can be made precise. And it turns out if you look at these asymptotically flat slices and the Hawking energy along these asymptotically round spheres, they approach this total measure of mass if you're at, at rest relative to the black hole, or if it happens that your slice is boosted, it will approach a total energy rather than a mass. But we can get the mass from taking an infimum over all of these possible energies, or you can use the second fundamental form of your slice to actually get hold of a momentum vector, and then the mass comes out from our special relativity understanding of, of energy and momentum. So that's intuitively how we get hold of total mass and total energy when we're considering asymptotically Euclidean slices of our spacetime. Another thing we can do is rather than talking about asymptotically Euclidean slices, we can look at null hypersurfaces. Now, rather than looking at a fixed slice and you take round spheres to infinity, what you could do is fix your null hypersurface Imagine that you have a foliation by these slices, and as you slide this down, this will induce a foliation on this null hypersurface. And asymptotically, as you slide down, these cross sections will also become round. If I measure the Hawking energy along these foliations, that gives us a, another measure of energy called the Trapman Bondi energy. And the reason why that Trapman Bondi energy is total energy modded out by gravitational radiation can be seen right here. Imagine that we have an incoming gravitational wave. If I slide this to the past, as I move back in time, my gravitational wave slides back in time. So you're never actually measuring the gravitational wave inside of my two sphere. So it's actually calculating total mass and energy except gravitational waves that have not entered. So that's heuristically why the, the, the troutman bondi energy mods out gravitational, ingoing gravitational waves if you move far to the past. Now, as I was able to get hold of total energy and total mass using only the geometry of my slices, I can do the same for a null hypersurface. And what one can do is you can choose a, because a null hypersurface is basically a congruence of, is a congruence of null geodesics, you can actually get hold of the asymptotically round foliations of this null hypersurface just by specifying an appropriate ge uh, geodesic foliation 
and the foliation will you can force to have a conformal relation to the standard round metric by exactly this conformal factor, and that will get hold of all of the asymptotically round possibilities under boosts, and each one of these will yield a different energy. If we take an infimum over all of those energy energies, we get what's called the total Troutman bonding mass of an asymptotically uh, flat null hypersurface. So we can reformulate the null Penrose inequality in terms of the null setting by changing the ADM mass to the right by the bonding mass. Okay, so this is called the null Penrose inequality. And in a certain sense, it's a little bit stronger than the, uh, than the uh, uh, standard because, the, because this mods out by gravitational waves, you can think of this as a, a slightly sharper inequality, but there's still a lot of work to be done, as the comment was made earlier, in relating all of these quantities in a mathematically rigorous way. But this is how one can reformulate this in terms of the null setting. Okay, so what is known in the asymptotically Euclidean case, if we have no horizon, this is the famous positive mass theorem, which was proven by Rick Shane and Professor Yao, and also used a, a, a Witten gave a proof using spinner techniques. Uh, if it happens that our slice is time symmetric, the Euclidean slice is time symmetric, what that means is the second fundamental form is trivial, so it reduces to a purely Riemannian problem called the Riemannian Penrose inequality. And in 97, uh, Gerhard and Tom Elman gave a proof using an interesting geometric flow under inverse mean curvature. And uh, my supervisor, Hugh Bray, gave a proof in 99, which in, in that case, they were able to prove the inequality for one connected component. If you have uh, multiple black holes, you can only use their uh, procedure to prove the underestimate for one connected component. And Bray was able to relieve that restraint of any number of connected components. How about the null case? In the null case, if we assume that the null hypersurface is shear free, what that means is the second fundamental form is proportional to the metric. A proof was given by Johannes Sauter in 2018 in his, in his thesis. So, continuing with the Penrose conjecture and attacking the Penrose conjecture, I, I would like to concentrate on the geometric flow approach. What made Huskin and Ilmanen's approach really nice in the time symmetric setting was they were able to flow Hawking energy and partially why Hawking energy behaves nicely in that setting is because time symmetry forces it to be a mass. If you're in a rest frame, energy is mass. And that, we take the perspective of it behaving well when you choose that restriction on the geometry. Whereas in the null setting, because you have this freedom in the time directions, the Hawking energy actually doesn't behave that nicely. So one can come up with a plethora of ways to make the Hawking energy monotonic which were, gave a proof in the time symmetric setting. Here the problem is, because it has this freedom in the time dimension, infinitesimal boosts can enter the picture in, in any number of ways, and that stops the convergence of walking energy from being physically meaningful. So the angle we take on hopefully rectifying this is, okay, well, it's because it's not a mass. Energy is susceptible to these time perturbations, but a mass should not be. So that's how we attempted this problem. And the next thing was to, I would like to tell you how we constructed this, this mass that I've been defined with. So to start constructing this thing, I'm going to assume that I've got a two-sphere in my space-time. And because it's co-dimension two, I have two, no, two normal vectors available that I can play with. And because <coughs> the, 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 the two-sphere is Riemannian, my normal bundle is Lorentzian. So I've got a negative and a positive available. So I can choose both my L minus and L plus. Sorry, this should have been an L plus, this should have been an L minus, to be null. So they're not trivial, but their inner product with, each, with themselves is zero. I'll choose the convention so that the past with the future is two. And then we fix, over here we still have a gauge invariance if I stop the picture right there. And you fix the gauge invariance by specifying that L minus inner product is the mean curvature to give us one, which is equivalent to saying that the future null direction choice that I've made inner product of the mean curvature to give the mean curvature inner product itself. So for folks who don't know, if we have a co-dimension two surface, I can look at the normal variation of my tangent vector fields. That gives me a shape tensor of my ambient geometry, if you like. This is the second fundamental form, and the mean curvature is just the trace of that second fundamental form. Okay, so I need to choose a null basis to construct this mass. And I also need a connection one form. So I've told you how the uh, tangent components vary with the second fundamental form. This is how the normal components vary in the normal direction along the surface. So for that, we need this connection one form tau. Okay, and that <coughs> introduces 
on the way to our mass function of this thing that I call geometric flux. And this is related to the mass aspect function of Christa de Lequine. I meant the folks who know what that means. So to construct this function on my two-sphere, I take the Gauss curvature. I subtract one-fourth the inner product of the mean curvature with itself. And then I add on the divergence. So this is a connection on my surface. I add on the divergence of, of tau. That gives me this flux function. And I've been throwing this name, Hawking energy, Hawking energy, at you for a couple of slides now. This is how you can write it in terms of this row. Okay? So for folks who want to see what the Hawking energy is, there it is. Now notice what's, if I just wanted to motivate rho by having it integrate to be the Hawking energy, there's absolutely no need for this term by the divergence theorem, right? Because if I integrate, it just goes to zero. Well, it turns out that has very interesting null geometric properties related to it. So the mass that I construct that I've been uh, uh, tempting you with up until now is to take rather the two-thirds power of rho, so now I can't ignore the contribution of tau, to integrate that and then to correct to the three-halves power. So I claim this is a meaningful mass quantity. Okay, so of course, why the heck do we think of that ugly-looking thing as a mass? All right, well, as with anything in, in math, we play with our favorite toy models, and I played with Schwarzschild. So the Schwarzschild space-time is an isolated, static, spherically symmetric black hole space-time. The singularity at r equals to zero gives rise to the black hole. And it turns out that if you look at the constant v slices, so this is Schwarzschild and in going Eddington Finkelstein coordinates, constant v slices is exactly a null cone, a null hypersurface. So what I would like to do is just study an arbitrary cross section of this null hypersurface, because that's what we're playing with when we're trying to understand the null Penrose inequality. And it turns out that because it's foliated by null geodesics, any cross-section can be uniquely identified just as a function in the radial coordinate. Okay, So I can identify any cross-section inside of this null cone just by specifying the radial <coughs> coordinate r as a function over a two-sphere. And beautifully, this quantity rho, this flux function, on, if you use the gauss kadazi equations, has a very, very simple form. It's two times the black hole mass over omega, which is the graph function in r cubed. The metric on an arbitrary cross-section is also very simple. If V is constant, this vanishes, this vanishes, R is just omega squared. So we're just some conformal, uh, uh, conformally rescaled uh, metric on, on the round sphere. And this is partially why we choose the two-thirds and three-halves. Look what happens. If I look at rho to the two-thirds power, my cube becomes a square. My area form has an omega squared in it, so I actually completely get rid of the geometry by using the two-thirds power, the omega squared to cancel. And irrespective of how ridiculously wobbly in the time dimension this cross-section is, I always yank out precisely the black hole mass. Okay, so that's partially why the two-thirds and three-halves come out. Okay, but that is, of course, not enough. The main interest in this functional is the following theorem. So in general, so now go to an arbitrary two-sphere in your favorite space-time and look at, it, at a flow along your favorite null direction to the past. That will induce a null flow off of the two surface. If we assume that our flux function along this foliation remains non-zero, we get this following propagation for the mass, okay? this propagation equation for the mass functional. Now remember, for this thing to be a mass, if we flow perpendicularly off, we've got expanding two spheres. We assume more matter is being engulfed in this expansion. So we would expect for this to be a useful mass for it to increase. And we get pretty close. So this is the second fundamental form in the L minus direction, but that's irrelevant. It's squared, so that's non-negative. The dominant energy condition actually causes this Einstein coverage component to be non-negative. So that's not going to bother us. The same goes here. Interestingly, we have this very complicated null vector n popping into this propagation, but it turns out this n, for folks who know the dominant energy condition, po points into the same component of the null cone to the past on sigma as L minus does. So all that is to say non-negative, 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 non-negative. So the only obstruction that we have to monotonicity are these two quantities. So we need rho to be positive, and we need the inner product of the mean curvature with itself to dominate the Laplacian of log rho. Okay, so we maybe put that on the board. So rho needs to be positive, and we may need the mean curvature to dominate the Laplacian of log rho. And this I'll call double convexity, okay, just to give it a name. Okay, so we see that if we have this 
double convexity and the dominant energy condition, we will indeed have an increasing mass function. So it has some very interesting monotonicity. Okay, well, let's just go test it in our point model. Well, in Schwarzschild, if you look at an arbitrary cross-section, we know rho is strictly positive because it's 2m over omega cubed. The second <coughs> condition is exactly 1 over omega squared, 1 minus 2m over omega, which is strictly positive as long as the graph is outside of 2m. Well, what happens when omega equals 2m? Well, that's precisely when we're on a black hole horizon. Okay, so in Schwarzschild, r equals 2m is exactly the black hole horizon. So this inequality being non-negative actually identifies also the black hole in Schwarzschild. Okay? And more specifically, one can, in general, identify a black hole from our context by having a surface where the inner product with the mean curvature of the self is zero. Of course, in Schwarzschild, this is a special example. I was told not to call it a MOTS, but we call that a marginally out of trap surface. Okay. So the logic is that you, you assume double convexity to show the positive. So, so no, I, I just count in Schwarzschild, I just yeah, calculate yeah. this qu yeah, quantity yeah, explicitly. Yeah, yeah. You can calculate it explicitly, yeah. and you can see at least in this example it's motivated physically because it tells you as soon as you're outside of the black hole, you've got precisely the second condition. But we don't know in general whether yeah. it's true. Okay. So that's that's the next thing to study. So how generic is this is this condition? Okay, but that's of course very complicated. So let's just for a minute clean up all the other loose ends that we have. So great, we seem to have some sort of a monotonicity. But that doesn't mean anything if we haven't solved the problem that we started with, which was, and remember, if I used walking energy, the limit didn't really have physical significance. If this quantity doesn't have physical significance and the limit, we're dead in the water. So let's check. Well, there's a way to uh, uh, describe an asymptotically flat null hypersurface, due to Mark Mars and his student, Alberto Soria. And if we assume the dominant energy conditions, all the things that we usually do, we get some very interesting limits asymptotically. So if I choose my foliation to be asymptotically geodesic, which just means that I'm not collecting anywhere fine in a finite region on my, I don't want my, my surfaces to start to become huge lopsided. So I would like my surfaces to go to infinity. And the most generic way to do that is just to assume that I'm asymptotically geodesic. Then one can relate that to the induced metric just by saying it's some conformal rescaling by, by some function p. Okay, great, so let's choose such a foliation. If you look at the limit of this quantity, you actually find that the limit is independent of the foliation you've chosen. So remember, in short shield, we got the same answer irrespective of the flow, irrespective of the cross-section. In general, we get this again. Okay, so the limit has, is finite, and we can see that it's independent of phi. So it's independent of the flow that you've actually chosen, so that's a good start. If you are able to choose one amongst this family, this large family that has the double convexity condition satisfied, it turns out that this limit that you reach is actually the limit of the Hawking energy. And since you've taken the infimum over all positive, all pos possible limits, this also encapsulates the, 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 the fees that give us asymptotically round leaves. So this limit, it has to be an underestimate of the bonding mass. So that's good. We've got a limit. It, we might not know exactly what it is, but it's smaller than the physical quantity we're trying to relate it to. All right? And if it happens that your double key convex foliation starts from a black hole, that second condition forces rho to be constant, and then it is exa exactly the mass of the black hole horizon that we wanted in Penrose. So the takeaway is the following. If we can find a doubly convex example amongst the family, We've proven the Penrose inequality in the null case. Okay. So, yes, we have physically significant limits on this quantity. Just I, I it. Thanks. Okay. Moreover, if we have a quality, we can actually show, uh, so if we can find a foliation that's strictly doubly convex and we actually hit a quality here, it also has a rigidity associated to it. That null cone has to be the short shield example. Okay. So, we have physically significant asymptotics, and we have these convexity conditions that we need to play with in order to see if monotonicity exists. So, so Schwarzschild case is an actual... It's an actual equality, and it turns out it's the only one. Okay. So it's, it's the, well, there, there is a caveat. You need to have the, this inequality. The second one has to be strictly true amongst one of them if you hit equality. Mm -hmm. And that forces the null cone not only to be, it, it forces the null cone to be only the Schwarzschild one. But in the previous slide, you showed the Schwarzschild case. 
I can get the result that it is zero. Zero? So we go doing this integral, right? Yes. So it's equal to the Hawking mass here, and it has to become the Bondi mass at large distance. And in right? Schwarzschild, it turns out all of those things are the same. They're all equal. I see. So, so the foliation, the derivative is actually zero along. But rho is not zero. Rho is not zero, but the, the rate of change of m is zero. Ah, that was not clear to me. Okay. There. And the reason why that is, is if you go back to this, yeah. this vanishes, this is vacuum, so that vanishes, so this doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter. This vanishes and this vanishes. Okay. Okay. So that's why. Right. So in Schrottschild, we have equality. Okay, so yeah, I mean, that means we're left with the big question, how reasonable is double convexity? Now notice if I'm doubly convex off of my horizon, off of a black hole, on a black hole this quantity is zero, so that forces an inequality on the divergence of log rho. So for me to have monotonicity off of a black hole, I have to start with a black hole where rho is constant. Okay, and that's actually why we get that the mass is equal to the Penrose mass if double convexity holds off of the black hole in the previous slide. So what we need to search for, even to start searching for double com com doubly convex foliations, are black holes where rho is constant. Okay, so that was my, my work for the last couple of months, and um, one place that I was able to find this, it's not quite as general as I'd like, but it's a good start, is inside of weakly isolated horizons. Okay, so one place we can search for doubly convex black holes is in weakly isolated horizons, and here you've got three mathematical conditions that might be a little confusing. These are just results that make this a model for a black hole event horizon more general than a killing horizon. So these are the minimal things I need to assume in order to get hold of doubly convex black holes inside of a weak isolated horizon. Okay, so in particular, I need it to be totally geodesic, which means any cross-section is a black hole. There's a second condition that forces the surface gravity to be constant. And then finally, I need a condition that says my expansion to the past is constant along some given foliation. If that's confusing, these conditions are just, if, if you prefer, the most general conditions I can use to prove the following theorem. Okay, so we also need one condition which is also potentially a little bit painful to keep, to keep stored away. We need the, the event horizon model that we're playing with to be strictly stable. Stability is defined as a variation, a linearization around a marginally out of trap surface. So if you take a small linearization to the past null direction of your mean curvature, you get a second order elliptic PDE, which I've given you right here. To say that it's strictly stable is to say that this PDE has a positive principal eigenvalue. Okay. But th th that's a, 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 a way to, to classify stability for, for a black hole. So with all of these conditions that I may have lost you slightly with, but that's okay, we get the following relationship, I can calculate precisely what the rho is for a cross-section of my weakly isolated horizon. L star here is the L2 adjoint of the elliptic operator up here, and it turns out we can solve this precisely, and we get a unique foliation in a weakly isolated horizon by these doubly convex black holes. So we can definitely find them inside of weakly isolated horizons. Okay, great, but that was once again just a nice model to start with, but it turns out we can do a little bit better so rho naught is just ga Gauss curvature. It's just Gauss curvature plus the divergence of tau. So I've ignored the inner product of H with itself, which of course is zero on the mass. If you look at the linearization, the co-dimension two linearization of this quantity and the mean curvature, you actually get a system of elliptic PDE. If H is strictly stable, it turns out the system is invertible. So what does that mean? It means that if I start from a space-time with a strictly stable weakly isolated horizon, I can perturb it slightly into anything I like, and I will continue to be able to find uh, doubly convex black holes. Okay? So in particular, that allows us to also prove using uh, a direct analysis of the ODEs, uh, which I borrowed from uh, Spiro Alexakis, you can actually use this result to show that if you have short shield and you perturb it slightly, you can actually also, the, the Penrose inequality, the null Penrose inequality is stable. Okay, so it's true on short shield and it's true for small perturbations. Thank you. Questions for the speaker? So I think I just want to recap with you. So uh, you have the Egon's mass. Yep. 
and you need to prove that the error is of course was positive and then you found that you need this you need this convexity and then you you found that to have this convexity you need rho positive and to have rho positive you need it weakly isolated horizon. Oh so right, we need this to be true for monotonicity. Right. So in particular, if I would like to relate the black hole to the bonding mass, it needs to be true on the black hole. <coughs> right. Right? Yeah. If that's true on the black hole, rho must be positive. Uh, must be constant, excuse me. And this is true for... And I... Uh, so, so, yeah, I'm chipping away at this. I'm definitely not claiming that I've proven this, but I'm chipping away at where, could this be true in general. And so far, what I've been able to do is I can find at least black holes that are doubly convex, which I must have to even start off being monotonically increasing. And I found these in weakly isolated horizons. And this also allowed me to show that the Penrose inequality is stable for the Schrotschild space time. So it's true on Schrotschild because it's actually the case of equality, right? Mm -hmm. And small perturbations don't. I'm making assumptions about the curvature, of course, of my perturbations. I haven't proven that that's a really, really difficult hyperbolic stability problem. But if, if you assume reasonable decay after an arbitrary perturbation of Schrotschild, you actually still find these black holes. So great, so you seem to be able to find them, but now the big question is, okay, great, can you continue off of the black hole with a doubly convex foliation? And that's where the research is right now. And how is your mass related to other... Great question, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's another big thing that me and Jordan have been talking about, that we need to... There are some beautiful mass. If you have small perturbations of Schwarzschild, it, it must include then care with small angular momentum. Yeah, right. So what, what, what is the state for care or care perturbations? But I think uh, the, that that is almost to be expected just by, the, the, if you look at Kerr, the area, black, the, the black hole mass is strictly smaller than the bonding mass for, positive, for, for, for A, positive. So you expect that in that direction at least, of course, the, in, the equality should be should be satisfied. So yeah, I mean, you, you just expect because it's a strict underestimate for the total bonding mass that it should be true there. It's and what would the prospects be for doing something perturbative around it? As, as yeah, you, as you've done. So basically, pushing the perturbation even further from that. Yeah, that's that's. It seems to be. So we maybe we need to do more, but it seems like we always got this foliation of doubly convex mots as long as the killing horizon is subextremal. So you can therefore perturb around subextremal. Um, but how far you can perturb is, is a very much open question. Yeah, here, here I'm, I'm very much piggybacking off of the inverse function theorem, and that's of course not a very robust so estimate. The area here is always in the pair horizon? That yes, that's correct. That's correct, yeah. I'm, I'm assuming h in a product h is zero. Yeah. So, just to follow up on Jordan's question, it looks like you have proved, not just for Schwarzschild, but for the whole curve family, small perturbations will still satisfy the Penrose condition, right? And I'm, I'm just, uh, just to piggyback off of that comment, it's not too surprising because in yeah, that... Yeah, it's thing, easier for the curve. Exactly. Because, because it's already strict. less. Yeah. It's strict. So, yeah, it's strict of course, small so, of course, yeah, yeah, exactly. The Schwarzschild was a hard case and you're Because proving. it's equality, yeah. yeah. It's, so you need to show that it's a stable... Exactly, it's like this. Whereas, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not like this. <laughs> Good. So then what's left? You need to do it for large deviations? Yeah, that? so the problem is uh, for this to be to remain in the elliptic system, what's nice about this being solvable is because I'm dealing with a weakly isolated horizon. The second fundamental form of this black hole model is trivial. What you want to do is prove this in more general cases where that second fundamental form is not necessarily trivial. And then this becomes a very complicated fourth order elliptic system. And it's not necessarily invertible. But the but panel is actually once you went horizon, here is always a panel horizon. Yeah. So the, the argument the panel used to try to control the cost of tendency has to be event horizon. Because the, the area does not increase for a panel horizon. So I think it's a major problem to see how to work it out for event horizon. Otherwise it doesn't give you anything at all. <coughs> And the apparent horizon is also quasi-local construction where the event horizon is a global, you, yeah. you need a lot more information to make sense of it. So apparent horizon is, is maybe not as great, but it's at least something we can deal with on a local level. Yeah. Whereas with event horizon, you need to know the total future of evolution of the system to be able to specify what the event horizon is. So you've got global issues to deal with if you want to play. So all of your theorems are for the apparent, apparent horizon. horizon? Apparent horizon, yes. Okay. yes. 
because we don't have the whole space. To no, 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 no. Yeah, that original picture was was a big heresy. But I mean, yeah. that's that's what motivated inequality. So I would like. I want. I thought it was a really nice argument, so I wanted to show it to you, even though it's not the heresy. Okay, so let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you.